Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that could save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org. In partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Who creates the biggest breakthroughs in medicine? It's the innovators. They're people who can see things in a way that others can't. They can put the pieces together that no one has ever thought of before, at least no one else. These innovators simply see things differently. While most of us focus on the problem, these innovators tune their antenna to the solution. Even more, they're not only seeing the solution, they don't just see it, they actually take action on it to create it. It's why serial entrepreneur Jeff Stevens has not only saved the lives of babies, but in the future, might just be responsible for the technology which saves your life as well. Jeff Stevens is not a doctor. He's never worked in medicine in any capacity, but he is making the changes that we all want to see in medicine as a computer scientist. He cut his teeth on healthcare innovation, combining what he learned about the physics of a microphone as a music engineer intern with the data analytics he practiced on Wall Street. Coming up, you'll find out the diagnostic tool he created for expecting moms, which caught the attention of NASA and what he's doing now to help put life-saving tools in your hands. I can't wait for Jeff to share his story. What about you? Kim, that is a heck of an intro. And I don't know how- Big build up. (laughs) Yeah, how are we gonna cover all of that in what, 40 some odd minutes, so- I know from when he was nine years old. Exactly. I'm trying to think of what I was doing when I was nine, probably just riding a bike around the neighborhood. (laughs) But- uh, (laughs) Try not to, you know, hurt myself. <laughs> well, actually, I actually all started as a paper route, so I was riding my bike too. <laughs> well, oh, really, Jeff? Yes, wow. I had a paper route too. <laughs> we, we've so, got that in common, Jeff. My old Schwinn Stingray. That's all how it all began. But now, you know, the the paper routes are all done by adults in a car with flying papers out the window. <laughs> are there still papers? Actually, in my neighborhood, there are, surprisingly. Well, that's, you know, obviously we're things went sideways real quick here, but you can't get a paper route anymore as a kid um, because you're right. It's all adults driving these things around if if anyone's actually reading newspapers anymore. But that's neither here come nor there. It, it was, come on, it was the parents anyway that were it doing was. it. I know it with was. my brothers on a rainy day, my parents had to get up at four o'clock in the morning with my brothers and drive my brothers around. Yep, so. that's that is exactly my dad and my mom my, for Sunday delivery. Yes, we were up at five, stuff in the papers, and then he drove me around. So it's it was really on on his shoulders that the papers got delivered, not mine or my legs for that matter. So I, I was lucky. I was in Southern California, and we all know the old song: "It never rains in Southern California." And I also had the afternoon paper out after school, not morning. So, but let's jump into medicine. Let's <laughs> jump into, well, we still have a while away from getting into your medicine because you had quite the journey before we even got there. So let's kick things off before we let this story unfold with a moment of inspiration from Dr. John Phillips. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular, vascular moment of inspiration. Well, Kim, as you know, I'm down here in the Florida Keys for um, spring break. And I'm looking up, trying to figure out, okay, who am I going to quote here? And lo and behold, Ernest Hemingway, who spent a lot of time time in Key West. And we were actually at a um, bass pro shop 
in Isle Morada and they have his boat there. So I thought, all right, let me get a cool quote from Ernest Hemingway. Now, speaking of seeing things in a new way, he is a novelist and, and um, you, you know, a writer. He kind of had a, a twist on, on on how to create a novel. But um, and he's a little bit morose. And unfortunately, he committed suicide like in 1961. But yeah. so I, found, I didn't want to I didn't want to get a, a kind of a um, a downtrodden quote. So I found this one and he's quoted as saying, worry a little bit every day. And in a lifetime, you will lose a couple of years. If something is wrong, fix it if you can. But train yourself not to worry. Worry never fixes anything. And I kind of like that. You know, you're on vacation. Don't worry, be happy, like the song says. So here we are. <laughs> Love it. You know, you bring up a good point. I, I touched on it in my introduction that if you're sitting there on the problem frequency, which is bringing you to the point of worry, right? You're never going to tune in to the frequency with the solution because you can't be on both frequencies at once. You have to get beyond the worry, beyond the problem to see the solution. And I, I think, and I'm curious from Jeff's standpoint is, do you visually see two different frequencies when it comes to the problem and solution? So that's actually a great question, Kim. Um, I and welcome, welcome to the show, by the way, Jeff. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I just so, jump right in. <laughs> the, the, I have a favorite way to answer that question. There was a movie once called Hellstrom Chronicles, and Technicolor was hired to make a lens, a telephoto zoom lens for that one movie for only one shot. It was a zoom that started at a distant mountain range, full screen. And by the end of the pan and zoom, without any breaks at all, it showed water droplets hitting an ant on a leaf. Wow. The way my, my, if all of our brains are wired differently. That's one of the beauties of humanity. And the way mine is wired is most people either see the forest or they see the trees or they see the leaves. Mm -hmm. I have the ability to zoom in and see the whole picture or zoom out and see the whole picture. And so I, I think of myself as someone who sees more dots at the same time than, than most. And I'm a connector of dots. So it's those leaves that I see more of at the same time. And so I've got a bigger picture. So from your term of frequency, I think it, it, it might be that I'm on, I'm seeing all of these planes simultaneously, temporarily. It's interesting that you mentioned the dots because this is something that rings true across um, all of the most incredibly impactful entrepreneurs from Steve Jobs to Sir Richard Branson. If you Google them about connecting the dots, they always say A, B, C, and D. That stands for always be connecting the dots. You, you can't always, you know, you don't want to just always look backwards, but in order to understand where you're at and catapult yourself forward, you need to connect the dots because you may not at the time understand why you were at point A or understand why you were at point C, but suddenly you're over at F and you can look back and realize that A and C led you to where you are able to be successful at point F. And with me, that's an automatic process. I don't go through <clears throat> a thought process to be able to do that. It's just, I, I, I can visualize things that aren't typically visualized. And it's not like it's a 2D or a 3D picture. It, it's, it's literally, I see data points and, and I begin to understand, they coalesce for me. So I call it connecting dots. It's not literally connecting dots in my mind. Excuse me, it's not consciously. That's all done subconsciously in my mind. It's like a sixth sense. Uh, very much so, I call it my trick knee. <laughs> no, it, 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 that's exactly right. I, I've never thought of it as a sixth sense, but... In, I, in, instead of seeing dead people, you see dots. Let's sweep. Um, <laughs> I like fortunately the, haven't, seen, I, I, I haven't seen too many dead people, so I, I'm <laughs> blessed with that, fortunately. 
Well, that's good because we're hoping that with your technology and the things you're creating right now in healthcare, that we won't see very many dead people in our it's future. It's from the movie, the movie, The Sixth Sense. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, coming up right here on The Heart of Innovation, we are going to start with Jeff Stevens' paper route and get you all the way to where he is creating what ultimately could become life-saving technology in your pocket. So stay with us. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including Cardiovascular System's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our conversation with Jeff Stevens, serial entrepreneur and um I had a paper out at nine years old. So, Jeff, let's get right into the story. Nine years old, you have a paper out, and then I hear at 11, you're already programming. So how did, and you're a dot connector, right? So how did that uh, come about? How did that evolve for you? So actually, my mom connected those dots. It turned out in summer camp um, between sixth and seventh grade, my mom wrote me and told me that a neighbor was going to be the TA for a computer science class at the Museum of Science and Industry in downtown Los Angeles during summer school and asked me if I wanted to go. And I didn't have anything planned because there was no football going on then. And that's what I was into. <laughs> and so I went and took a, like an eight-week class and I was hooked by logic. And I gave up on sports and went down the logic rabbit hole. And um, you were just buried in your computer from age 11 on. So I had I was so infected by logic that the next step after this class was to go and engineer, socially engineer my way into having an account on one of the five largest mainframes in the world, which was at UCLA. So we, we, I call it social engineering. It was it was it's called shoulder surfing. People don't worry about an 11-year-old kid looking over their shoulder in a computer room. And so I was able to get access to a computer account. And the first thing I went after was the accounting file to see if I could find professors that didn't use any of their computer time. Because every professor automatically got $5,000 in, in computer time every quarter. And because security was not even a forethought, an afterthought, and anything thought back in the day. Um, white collar crime wasn't even a term yet that didn't exist as a term. So I found that file and I learned by using the, the time of professors that had never, ever used a computer once during their tenure in the school. And to figure out what I should learn, I actually went to the computer science department at UCLA. And by happenstance, I showed up at lunchtime. So the only person, the only office in the whole department that was occupied turned out to be the chairman. And I told him that my father had given me his computer account and I wanted to go learn my next language. I'd learned basic during summer school. And he told me to go learn PL1. He told me how to go about doing it. I went and bought no, that's that's a that's pro, that's a programming language, basically. PL, PL1 is an old programming language. PL1 stands for programming language one. Makes sense. And Makes um, sense. Uh, it was an old IBM mainframe language. So I'm an old dyed in the wool IBM mainframe guy. And well, a lot of people who are listening probably don't understand what that is. <laughs> oh, that's true. Mainframes are the computers that live in the, the cloud at large corporations. So they're, they're not all these computers that are in the cloud are small little boxes like we were used to seeing. Some of them take up entire rooms. 
and they run the same operating systems that are on those small boxes on our desktops, but they're they're quite megalithic. Hmm. So um, it's actually still a growth industry. If you look at IBM, their mainframe business is about a two to three percent growth a year still, because they're safer machines. Right, right? You, you you can consolidate the risk in, into a single machine instead of fifty machines. Yeah, they so were safer via you got in. This was the, there was no such thing as security back in the day, Kim, <laughs> right? It was, and no one worried about an 11-year-old kid looking over their shoulder and taking their computer account, which is how I started, right? But, and, and from there, um, I, I basically just fell in love being inside computer. I became a TA I was, as an undergraduate. I was a, a teaching assistant, which is normally you'd have to be a master's student to do that at UCLA. But I'd been using this, I understood the language so well, I could add value, so they let me. It's not like it was a paid position. <laughs> and what, and what like, are you, like you said you fell in love with the logic, so, and that, that's the logic of coding and how it all kind of makes sense, right? What, what are, I guess, what are you coding or what are you, what are you thinking about doing as in, in, in college? Like, I'm, I'm assuming you're a computer engineering major. Oh, actually, not at all, right? It, it's computers were a hobby to me. It was, it was just, it was a fascination. It's what I spent more time doing than most anything else, including school. And so um, I, I really just taught myself programming languages. When I got to high school in LA, I decided for the first time to write something really big and important. It wasn't for anybody. It was purely intellectual. So I wrote a complete accounting system, accounts receivable, payables, finance, order entry, order entry, order entry inventory, I, I pretended I'd been hired by a department store in Westwood, right outside UCLA, to write their whole back-end accounting system. And that's what I, so I needed to teach myself how to do that. So I taught myself accounting, T-accounts, and then I, I wrote the programs. And um, when I got to college was the first time I actually went and got paid to do programming. And I was a time- And that shop. wasn't for accounting systems. Actually, it was at a company called, it's still around, called Collins Foods International. Um, at the time, they owned Sizzler Family Steakhouses, and they were the largest franchisee of Kentucky Fried Rats. And they, they had a mainframe. <laughs> and and um, uh, they had a lot of users on it. And I was the person that helped all the users when they got in trouble. So I was the fix it up chappy, oh. so to speak. So yeah. what did you and study that, in college? That was the... In college, I studied, I started as a biochemistry major and, because I wanted to be a doctor. And when I, and I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And this was about the time when psychiatry had the rug pulled out from it economically because it was not objective, it was subjective. And the insurance companies basically said, we're done with this. And... So that was the reason why I decided not to go to medical school. I still took the MCAT. I took the first year of what was known as the new MCAT. It's now the current MCAT, but it was called the new MCAT. So that if I wanted to go to medical school in the future, I'd at least put the stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but I ended up getting a degree in business economics because it was the quickest way out of UCLA once I decided I didn't want to be a doctor because I was already an econ minor. So I just turned it into a major and and finished up that and went on to consulting work. But, you know, in terms of paying for college, it wasn't working for that restaurant chain. That's, that's, at that's the, tough. At the that's head tough. end. How did you pay to have your own apartment and, and that kind of thing? So I learned one day that every night, in the machine, in the computer room at UCLA, they updated a set of tapes. We used to have these round tapes. You've seen them in movies. <laughs> um, they had, they'd update a set of tapes with the latest that day's stock market information. And I don't think there's anybody that doesn't believe the stock market is manipulated by some people in some way every day, every hour, every minute. And so I went and used statistical packages that were available on the mainframe with those purloined accounts that I had to go look for a uh, statistical look for accounts that were anomalous compared to all other stock trading. I was looking for outliers and I actually found two companies. They were both oil and gas exploration companies and they were clearly being manipulated. 
And so I wrote the coattails of the manipulators. I was using publicly available information, but I knew I could predict what they were going to do because they were, it was only two stocks and they kept doing it over and over and over again. And so uh, for a while I lived in a, I, I lived fairly high in the hog for a, for a college student. Um, and it was because I found a couple stocks that were being manipulated and used public data to make some money. Yeah, you were sitting there at Raymond James and you were on the trading floor with people that were three, four times your age. So it's, it's, it's a little teeny room that has three or four trading terminals in it. And I was the only person that wasn't at least 70 years old in the room. Wow. And, and they just they they just marveled. I, they didn't know what I was doing. I wouldn't let them know what I was doing. But I would show up at least four days a week. I only took afternoon classes, so I would be there in the morning, day trading in the morning. And then I took afternoon classes at UCLA. And it was it was a lot of fun, right? It was it it, it I it wasn't cheating at all, it was public data. But it was taking candy from a baby. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're gonna find out from Jeff how we went from taking candies from a baby or what seemed like it, to actually saving babies. So stay with us, and we'll continue in just a moment. Three years ago, my symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. No, it does not, because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD, peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps, or neuropathy when walking, and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients. And we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our LegSaver hotline, 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. The conversation is just starting to heat up here. Uh, what, uh, Jeff, you were taking candy from a baby, and uh, you know, you're know you working your way through college, and you're in L.A., right, where music studios, people are producing music, and you somehow get interested in microphones? Is that right? I was... I don't even remember how it happened, to be honest with you. But I ended up becoming what we, at the time we called a stereo rat. I hung out at one of the leading stereo stores in LA and just listened to incredible sound systems that I would never own. And just really enjoyed music. I got into the technical aspects of these amazing artists. And it turned out that the place where I used to hang out the upstairs in the back of the place was a recording studio. And so uh, eventually I asked if I could come to recordings and it took me being a pest before they finally let me come to my first recording. It, it wasn't there, it was uh, on location. It was called Flamenco Fever, directed this recording. And it was in the pouring rain and I worked my butt off and they thought I was just gonna hang out and watch. And so the next time I asked, they said, sure, and eventually they said to me, how come you've never asked to have your name on the back of an album? And I said, why would I care if my name was on an album? I'm here to learn about technology. And the, the, they eventually allowed me to start, quote unquote, playing with the microphones. And I showed that I understood the physics of actuators of microphones um, better than anyone but the founder of the company. 
And so from that point forward, I was allowed to be the person who set up all the microphones. So you're doing that to, you're learning about the, the physics of the microphone to capitalize and just make the sound much sound better. Is that the different, you use different types of physics for different types of sources A voice is You're going to do it with a different type of microphone than you're going to do a, uh, a bass fiddle. Um, okay. And, and uh, a guitar. They're all different types of pickups. Because so they. How did you, so, how did you get from music then at that point to Wall Street? Ooh. So. Uh, big jump, big jump. I was tired of. I was a computer consultant after college. And I was just, I had clients that I would solve problems for them. And it was boring. I wasn't being challenged. I was solving people's problems. I was making a good living, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't a challenge. Did you give up on the recording or the microphone thing at that point too? Or So I did that for about three years. Whenever they would invite me to a recording, they didn't, it was, it was a leading recording studio at the very high end. They only produced a, maybe 15 albums in total during their tenure. Did you meet some cool people? I'm not a name dropper. I right. <laughs> I was invited into some places that I will never, ever forget. Okay, enough uh, said. I'll, the, I'll, I'll share with you my favorite title on an album was the our Freddie Hubbard album. And because I showed up, it was on a day when we either had finals or midterms. It was test day at school. So I was late. I didn't work on that recording. I just showed up to hear it. And as I uh, walked into the, the the room where all the equipment is, in that gravelly voice we all knew of, of Freddie, he said, where the bleeps my Remy? And I realized as usual, no one had bought soda and munchies and alcohol. So before anyone even knew that I was there, I turned around, drove to a liquor store, and I walked in with a box full of everything, including a bottle of Remy Martin Cognac. So my title on that album was Head Gopher, G-O-P-H-U-R. <laughs> and then the only other story I'll tell you is that I got invited to the Village Recorder when Black Cow and Steely Dan recorded Black Cow and Half of Asia. Cool. And that was just unbelievable. To so see why would you give that up and end up going back into diving into the computer world. I mean, that sounds exciting. And that wasn't a challenge enough for you. I know you're always looking for a challenge. It wasn't actually challenging at all. It was rote. And that's why I didn't stick around. Hmm. I, I'm not a musician. There was nothing for me to challenge myself. Right. It was all technical and, yeah. you know, microphones, there's only so much. So there that you hit the heart of it. It just wasn't a challenge. The challenge was getting in the door and being invited back. Right. So um, back to the question of how did I end up on Wall Street, um, I decided I wanted to prove to myself that I could fit in in a large corporate environment. So it was really just a personal challenge. So I moved to New York without a job or a place to live. And I, at first, I actually wanted to become a high technology investment banker. That's what I and moved there to do. This is what time? What, what, what? Late 80s. Late 80s. Okay. Late 80s. And... Um, uh, it took me 11 months and a week to get a job on Wall Street. I would already hired the moving company to take me back to California. But in my own inevitable fashion, I hadn't packed a single box yet. Mm. I just don't give up. So you're just trying to get a job on Wall Street, what, selling? Yeah, or Get my foot in the door. Okay. So, and you'll take, you'll take anything at this point. Oh, no. Well, well it's got to be something that's got a vector that would interest me. Okay. Okay. Right. So not anything, absolutely. So what did you, what, what, uh, what'd you ultimately settle on or what, what, what was the opportunity? So um, there is a book called Liar's Poker. It's about a trading floor at Merrill Lynch where one trader, Howie Rubin, put three trading slips into his drawer in his desk instead of into the books and records of Merrill Lynch's accounting system. And Merrill Lynch en ended up losing hundreds of millions of dollars because of that. I was the control that got hired to come in and be the quote unquote systems manager. They didn't even know what they needed. They just knew they needed something. And to prevent that. 
it's all you politics. needed to be it's the risk mitigator. That's what they were looking for. That thank you very much because that that that's a great segue to what I think my best skill is is identifying and mitigating technology risk. And that's why I'm comfortable leading, living on the bleeding edges of technology. Because it's one thing to push the boundaries, it's another to have the comfort to know when to pull back. And, and so you're sitting there on Wall Street and you're looking to make another move. What brought you out then to Silicon Valley? It's completely two different cultures. In two different so from Merrill Lynch, right? uh, from Merrill Lynch, I ended up working three down from John Reed, chairman and CEO at Citicorp for a couple of years, building what, what we see as Salesforce automation now, but nothing like that. Contact management systems didn't exist. So we did a homegrown one for the thousands of Citibank salespeople in the mid-market group. And there was a changing of the guard and I knew they were going to be cleaning house in, at the highest technical levels at Citicorp. It's one of those purges. I wasn't in the purge, it was above me, but I, we knew who was coming in and I just, it was time to move on. And I interviewed and got hired. Um, I got offered the job at AIG Insurance to be their first ever chief internet architect. And AIG had a reputation on Wall Street on, in New York for being a sweatshop, one of the worst in, in IT. And I didn't know anybody who had survived more than two years there. So I assumed I wouldn't survive more than two years there. So I made one phone call out to this thing called Silicon Valley, where this dot com thing, whatever that was, was happening that was all over the news. And six weeks later, I lived here and I never went to work for AIG. <laughs> and coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to find out how he went from Wall Street to Silicon Valley to healthcare innovation, hoping to save lives. So stay with us right here on the Heart of Innovation. You have been diagnosed with peripheral arterial disease and you're wondering what's next. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lorenzo Patrone. I'm a vascular interventional radiologist in London in the UK. And with this week, I'm here with the medical notepad brought to you by Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated Patient Advocacy Campaign called Take a Stand Against Amputation and the Way to My Heart. People who are diagnosed with peripheral arterial disease, which is a restricted blood flow in mainly the leg arteries due to plaque buildup, are categorized in two different types, the claudicans and the critical limb ischemia. So it is important for you to know which categories applies to you because it dictates frontline treatment. So the claudicans are the people who can't walk very far before getting pain in their calves. They can get cramps and the walking distance for them could be 50 meters, 100 meters, one kilometer. Instead, critical limb ischemia are the patients who are most affected by peripheral arterial disease and are the patients who, for example, can't sleep in the bed because of the cramps coming into the night or instead, even worse, can have tissue loss, so little ulcers at the level of the foot. Why is it important to know where you fit in the diagnosis? Because most patients will never move beyond the clodican stage. And this is a disease that you can treat yourself you can push yourself through a pain. You can start by walking more and more, changing your lifestyle, stopping smoking and getting a better diet to develop collaterals. Means like if there's a blockage, you create little narrow streets around the main road in order to get the blood down to the leg as before. The more you push, the more you do exercise, the more you change your lifestyle, the more you will build up collaterals and the better will be for you. And the symptoms slowly, slowly, will go down. Of course, for critical limb ischemia instead, is a, a disease which is a rapidly progressive and it's important if you develop pain during the night or even worse, you have tissue loss, you contact as soon as possible your vascular doctor in order to get, of course, diagnosed with the right tools and treated. Remember that the advice and views offered are for educational purpose only. We have a very little chat, but always check with your own healthcare team for explicit content to act or any information offered there. If you want more info about peripheral arterial disease, go to standagainstamputation.com and for real-time support, go to thewaytomyheart.org. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. 
So Jeff, you now have moved to Silicon Valley and you're gonna get into the tech world, huh? Yeah, you know, I had a classic Silicon Valley job. I vested for my four years. I was the chief evangelist for a very disruptive, cool company in telecommunications. So again, a whole new industry for me, telecommunications. Um, why not? <laughs> and exactly, why not? It was a challenge, right? It was, I got, I was the chief technical mouse, mouthpiece for the company. I got to travel to almost 40 countries and travel is one of my favorite things, meeting other cultures. So it was, it was a wonderful job, but literally we were part, we all remember dot gone when Silicon Valley crashed. And I was literally the first person inside the company I was at to raise my hand and said, I'm two months from my four year vesting, vest me out and I'll get off your payroll today. <laughs> so now I took a breather uh, and because I could afford to, to figure out what I wanted to do next because I knew it wasn't going to be in telecommunications. It wasn't going to be on Wall Street. It was going to be something different. So but you started I, connecting the dots, right? Well, actually, I pay forward in life. And at an event that I used to go to every month to pay forward, I met a doctor who taught me that some OBGYNs have their moms uh, sit for an hour each day and count fetal kicks. The head doctor of the UK tells all the moms in the UK to do that. The head doctor in Utah tells all the moms in, the UK, in, in Utah to do that. The head high-risk OBGYN at Stanford Children's, Maury Drusen, this is a quote, he thinks it's a bunch of hooey. That's his word. And that's the beauty of medicine. It's an intersection of art and science and has been from the very beginning. And it's interpretive. And what I understood is that data is purely objectively interpretive. And it was time to start delivering more data to doctors to help more people. And I knew that, so I, I literally, after I met this, this doctor at this event, I didn't sleep for three days. All I did was sit in front of a computer. And at the end of those three days, I drove to Stanford, walked into the hospital, knocked on the door of a vice president, and literally, she said, come in. And I literally proclaimed that I knew how to identify a fetal heart death defect in utero. Excuse me, it really chokes me up to even talk about it. In the 10th to 12th week of life. Wow. And there was no question in my mind. And I said to her, I have no idea how to do what you all call the last mile medicine. Is there anyone here that will help me? And I learned that Stanford revels in people like me showing up. And if you've got something that really intrigues them, they surround you with the right people. And I'm talking chairmen of departments who then assign people to help you. It, it was just, you could hear it in the tone of my voice. It was an incredible journey. So what is it about you, this data analytics guy, the thought that you suddenly could actually be the one to create the technology to detect this defect? I understood the physics of listening inside the human body. And we don't have time now, but in data science, they were able to identify whales in a bay. And I knew that if they could identify with 97.3% accuracy, I knew if they could find the whale sound, them talking in the bay to alert ship pilots to stay away from them so they wouldn't be hit that I could hear the sounds no matter what was going on inside that woman's belly. So how do you take, you've got an idea, and I, I don't know if you have any hardware or anything to, act, to actualize this. Did you take the idea to Stanford and they helped you kind of put it together or what were the Not, not at all. Goals? So um, I, I understood the physics of what I wanted to do. Physics calls it an actuator, a microphone. And I went and found we don't have time for the story, but I found the person who knew how to invent what I wanted. And it turned out- And so your experience in the music industry is paying off to help in innovation for medicine. I literally, that moment in front of that doctor at that paying forward event, I connected those dots. It was obvious to me. That's why I spent three days without sleeping to go confirm that those dots really are- Right, because all a microphone is, is it's just a sensor. So you were taking that idea of a sensor 
So the, 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 the main thing, I, I don't want to get technical, but what I knew I'd be able to do and prove we could do is we could identify the sound of anomalous blood flows. Mm, okay. So the first thing that we were able to identify was something called tetralogy of Fallot. I'm probably mispronouncing it. No, you're right. You got it. You nailed it. And it was, I didn't hear it. I don't know what a murmur sounds like. I have doctors that use the electronic stethoscope that we invented here that I'm ta we're talking about now that can, that just are gobsmacked when they hear the, the sounds coming off a heart. And so a neonatologist used the technology and he lit up like a Christmas tree. He knew what he was hearing. He said, listen to this. And I said, dude, I don't hear any of that. Because so, I'm a main expert. So, so here's a you have this technology and it ended up um winning. You got the attention of NASA and you didn't win the first competition, you won the second competition once you figured out how to win a competition, always thinking. And ultimately beyond that, you guys started a company, the technology is on the market. You decide, okay, great, did what I Wait, needed what, to do there. What is it? So, real quick, though, you can buy. So, what's the technology? That, so it, 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 it was available. One of my two co founders ran with the technology. He got it approved for COVID. He's now going after getting it a, a general approval. Okay. It, it, it's actually not the form factor I would have made. Um, but, but this is focusing on OBG, like neonatology. It's, it's, or it's no? just the most badass, excuse my language, electronic stethoscope likely on on the earth right now okay and it, it has integrated ecg right okay. so, so it, it's actually beautifully diagnostic for a number of things and so you're falling in love with diagnostics at that point so the, 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 the sensor in case anybody wants to look it up it's called ballistocardiography so that's what the sensor was that i invented for listening inside the human body um and then, so I, I spent some time trying to figure out what I was going to do next and COVID hit. And in 2019, the government started reimbursing for what's called remote patient monitoring because we're only in front of doctors for less than 1% of our life. And if doctors had our data for the other 99%, they would know what's really going on. I'm a cardiology patient. My cardiologist at Stanford has no interest in what the blood pressure is when I show up for my appointment twice a year. But he insists that that morning I take my blood pressure and bring it to him because of white coat syndrome. So right now, the remote patient marketing, remote patient monitoring market is exploding exponentially. Over $600 million has been invested in just the platforms in the cloud in the last year. But they're all using first generation hardware to get the data from the patients. So I realized we needed a wearable and we have this is our our prototype. Those are the right, sensors you have a smartwatch that you've developed. So this, it doesn't have the screen on it yet, but this has all the sensors so that we can prove out the technology because the screen is just a screen. And so um, you can think of our device as a, a medical Apple watch. Apple's going after the lifestyle world. It's consumer grade data, except for ECG. And all of the data coming our, off our watch will be FDA approved. Oh, and this is something that is going to potentially be prescribed <laughs> by your doctor so get ready coming up right here on the heart of innovation we're going to find out just what this smartwatch is supposed to do and will be able to do so stay with us welcome back to the heart of innovation for more on today's topic go to theheartofinnovation.org that's theheartofinnovation.org once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. So, Jeff, you have created a wearable uh, that you said is kind of like a medical-grade Apple Watch. Tell us more about it. That's right. And it's not just me. It's a team of people. I, I bring together domain experts, right? So we're, we're an extensive team of people um, that have, have built this device. It's not just for vital signs, which is all that remote patient monitoring is doing now. We have over 20 different types of data that come off our data. One of them, for example, is called VO2 max, which is the gold standard for fitness. So if your parents are declining, as we all do eventually, you'll be able to get them this watch, even if your doctor, their doctor doesn't give it to them. And you'll be able to track and see many different types of data and declines and potential improvements um, it does gait analysis. So if, if someone is potentially at risk for falling, 
It, it, it handles that as well. But to me, the most important thing it does is for the first time ever in medicine, it will be approved by the FDA for new third party algorithms to be added to the watch after it's been delivered to the patient. So, so basically, I, you can add things to it. It's like software upgrades, right? It, it's all new, not just an upgrade. The FDA already allows that. This is all new algorithms that were different than anything on the watch before. And there's a number of researchers all over the world, thousands of them, that are building algorithms, and each of them has to go build their own wearable now. And none of them are hardware companies. And so that is ultimately, we are the edge AI platform for all of these innovators of algorithms in medicine. So how do they get into you in real time? So first of all, they have to get FDA approval. They'll do their clinical trials using our watch with their algorithm. And then they'll be, it'll be able to be prescribed. So you go to your cardiologist, he gives the watch, he clicks the box that he wants the algorithm for long QT syndrome, for example, to be on that watch. Because so Jeff, knows- sorry to interrupt, but we've got like two minutes left and I'm a, a pretty simple person. I'm looking at my wrist right now and I see, you know, there's my skin, there's my arteries, there's some muscle ligaments. What, like, how do you use that? I'm assuming you're looking at blood flow patterns and, and the electricity too that's generated to get all these algorithms and get all this data. Is that- so we, we don't have to time to go in depth, but if you look at the bottom of any smartwatch, you're going to see a green, a red, and an infrared light. Okay. And it's reading your blood flows to get something that's known as photoplasmography, PPG. Yep. And- Almost everything we do comes from PPG, okay. including VO2 max. And all of these things that we're going to be able to do have already been peer-reviewed, published in medicine. So we're not the pioneers of these algorithms at all. Many of them will go license or, they'll like, or they will revenue share with us as their algorithms are deployed. So this is a whole new model in medicine to bring these cutting-edge state-of-the-art algorithms that are coming out of medical institutions to market expeditiously. We're talking about being able to bring it to market in a matter of months after they're developed, not a matter of years. So where are we at in the process? Close us out here. So we're, we're, we've are we now de-risked the project. We have, as I've shown, the, the, our prototype running, and we can, we can demonstrate this to anyone, even over Zoom. And we're beginning our fundraising. We've got two tranches of $5 million each that we're looking to raise. And the second tranche will take us all the way into the market. It's about an 18 month period from when we're first funded until we'll be ready to start shipping our devices with FDA approval. That's incredible. Well, if anyone else wants to find out how your progress is going and they wanna learn more, do you have a website that they can visit? You're welcome to visit. You won't find much there, but there's a contact place there. It's physio, P-H-Y-S-I-O. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. Make sure to visit the website if you want to learn more big things to come in medicine. So stay with us right here on the Heart of Innovation every week, every Saturday for new innovation in healthcare. You've been listening to The Heart of Innovation with Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.